oftentimes they're looking for a quick fix. But what I will say is those that are doing it well and really moving the needle are those that are looking at this issue holistically. What is our employment brand in the market? Who are we competing with in our market? How does our total compensation package compete in that market? Do we know how to sell to candidates? Don't conduct your analysis in isolation because data is so incredibly powerful. Not defending just the tribe, but defending the organization. Those creative people that you really want to keep empowered, keep excited, keep motivated, keep thinking. A good experience pays dividends down the line. Stereotypes tend to break down in proximity. Welcome to We're Only Human, a podcast about human resources, business, technology, and the workplace. My name is Ben Eubanks, your host, and I'm so glad you're here. Hey, this is Ben, and I hope you enjoy the conversation you're about to hear with Pam and Tim from over at Advanced RPO. They were one of the supporters of this research. We're going to be talking about the conversation today. We'll pull out some of the key stats and things that you want to know about, but we also work with them on a research report. And so that link will be in the show notes. All you have to do is click the cover art on your podcast player, get over to the actual episode, and you can click through and get the copy of that report completely free. You can see some of the things we talk about here in the conversation and some other things we didn't have time to cover in that, frankly, it was very eye-opening to see what sort of interplay there was between employers and candidates in the data. And I know you'll enjoy that. All right, without any further ado, let's jump into this conversation with Pam and Tim. Hey, everyone. Welcome to We're Only Human. I'm really glad to have you here with us and looking forward to a great conversation today because you get not one, but two incredible experts and speakers here with us to, to share some ideas, to, to kick around what's happening in the space in terms of hiring, and also to, to share some of the things that they're finding from the front lines that's working, not working so much. And so all of us should walk away with some good takeaways, good ideas based on all of their experience. And I'm really excited to be diving into this. So Pam, Tim, both here from Advanced RPO. Welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Glad to be here, Ben. Thank you. Excellent. So before we dive into some of the fun stuff, Pam, would you please go first? Give us a little more about who you are and what you do for the audience, please. Sure. Pam Bearhoff. I have the pleasure of leading the team at Advanced RPO. I, I've actually worked in the RPO industry for the majority of my career. And over over that time, have just really enjoyed learning about so many companies and industries that we've supported over the course of my career. Right now, I really spend my time internally working with our leadership team on strategy. I'm also very involved with our customers leading executive government governance with all of our clients. And then beyond the, the day-to-day with Advanced RPO, I'm also very, very involved in the RPO industry. I'm as a board member of the RPOA and like to write about some of the topics that, you know, we're talking about today as well as speak at events and such. Recruiting's a bit of a lot of my life. <laughs> it's like the big piece of it. And I, again, I, I meant what I said earlier. I, every time I have a conversation, I have the, the opportunity to have a conversation with either of you, but it, I... I end up learning something. I end up with some interesting takeaways. I, I go away thinking about the problem in a different way. So I'm I'm thankful that the audience listening in here gets that benefit today. All right, Tim, over to you, sir. Sure. Uh, Tim O'Year, I'm head of sales and marketing here at Advanced RPO. I actually spend my week talking with uh, prospects and clients through the various challenges and you know, pains that they're, they're facing. And so it's collaborating and just thinking through and helping them understand uh, the options that they have. So it's been, it's interesting. And this is all share. This has been three decades for me and in, in recruitment process outsourcing. So we've seen a lot of things, but some things haven't changed as far as what good hiring, the foundation of what good hiring looks like. So it's interesting, but there's a lot of new things today that we're seeing. And I will share that, um, a uh, unique fact for, for you and the listeners, and I don't know that I like this term, but I've been, I don't know if Pam's been referenced as, but pioneers, I think in check wagons and those types of things, Ben, <laughs> but uh, pioneer in the RPO trail. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I say that because when we started our first uh, business in 1990, there was not, not, it wasn't called recruitment process outsourcing and there was no industry. It's been broad, but we've seen a lot of interesting things and the technology has certainly changed things, but it's not the cure all for good hiring. Yes. I, the implication there is that you've been blazing a trail for quite some time and we get the benefit of that expertise that you 
I tell everybody that the things that I know that I do well, I, I screwed them up the first time. So right. you probably have some fun stories we could swap. Uh, Absolutely. It's not polite over a drink um, at an event somewhere. Maybe we'll get back together at some point in the future. All right. So I've been looking forward to this. So let's dive into it first up. And I'll tell you, we, we just finished for the audience's sake. I, I didn't talk about this at the beginning, but we just finished a big study at Lighthouse. The team at Advanced came alongside us and supported that research and helped to help us to gather data, not just from employers, but from candidates as well. And so we, we saw some really amazing findings in there. I'm going to make sure and get the link to the report that we did with Advanced in the show notes for this episode. So you can click right over to that and check that out because I think that it's going to be the thing we're talking about today in this conversation. You'll get to go deeper in that and learn more about what's happening there and see some ideas, see some of the data, things like that. So one of the things I wanted to key in on is that we're seeing in this data that more employers are saying that hiring is not just this talent level or HR level issue, but it's rising to level of a business issue. And I'd love to get your take on that. Is that what you're hearing, you're seeing? What does that look like in practical terms? Pam, would you like to start us off? Sure. I would say yes. We absolutely um, are seeing organizations identify it and starting to try to address it at the business level. So I, th I think there's certainly an awareness and in many organizations, they, even at the highest level in the organization, it's a strategic priority for them to solve. The, the challenge that I see is that I, in reality, I don't know that a lot of business leaders really know where to start or really know how to solve this because it, quite frankly, it's a very complex issue and it's not, I think historically they have pointed the finger to HRTA, right? To say, fix it for me. And now that they're being brought in to try to solution it, I think they are recognizing the complexity of it. Tim, can I ask a follow-up to that one? Throw it your way? Unless you have to put it there, I, you probably did. I was going to ask a deeper question there, essentially, is for those leaders like Pam's talking about saying, okay, now we're suddenly, oh, this ball's in our court. How are you working with the companies and these leaders to, to prepare them for those conversations or to elevate those conversations inside the business? Because it feels like in some cases, if it's, if it comes to where we post to find them or how do we review our candidates or what our process looks like, most talent leaders are experts in that area. But when it comes mm -hmm. to how do I elevate this to suddenly, this is what it impacts the operational side. This is what it impacts in terms of profitability or customer satisfaction. We could impact those things depending on what leverage you're pulling and hiring. How are you enabling leaders to have those conversations um, on your side? Yeah, I, a lot of what we're doing is, again, understanding the baseline of where the organization is today and helping to build a business case, if you will. So here's your reality. And so it's taking a holistic look at the landscape to say the basics. And, and so many companies don't have this or don't do these things, Ben. And that is, how competitive truly are you in today's world? So from a comp compensation, that's really important. But... What's your website? What's your career site say about your culture? There's so many things that people need uh, that candidates and others are, are looking for. So it's helping put all that in a package. The executives are really understanding it's more than just getting a recruiter to hire someone. It's a big, there's a lot of barriers. And so what can we do to help make them aware of those barriers, expose some gaps they may have and can resolve, and then just move forward so you can have the metrics that you want in your hiring program, get good quality hires. But it starts with understanding the baseline. And unfortunately, a lot of folks just don't have um, their finger on the pulse of really where they are with baseline metrics they need today to compete. I mean, that's that startups and that's some Fortune 1000 companies at the same time. I had a bet going with Pam that you were going to bring up data first, probably. Mm -hmm. And so I think I won that one or she won that. We're both <laughs> won that one probably because she, she would take that bet. She'd know better. <laughs> any, any thoughts on how companies can get a, a grasp of that baseline essentially, because again, I, I, they're, they're experts in their process, but we're so focused on just churning out, putting rear ends and seats essentially, but we don't, we rarely pull back and say, okay, let's look at this holistically yeah. term term. Let's look at this across the board and say, We've been doing this for a long time. Is it still the best way? What's, you know, how do we know? And so any thoughts on how, or like, these are the two numbers you've got to look at for your baseline, or you've got to know, you've got to ask this question in order to really get a good grasp of where you are. Any hints on that side? 
I start with 99 questions, Ben, but I'll default to Pam so you can get a quick uh, response. I think it actually, it starts with what are you trying to accomplish as a business? What are your business initiatives? I think too many people are looking just for, you should just be looking for what's your time to fill. And when at the end of the day, as organizations evolve, I think talent acquisition has to evolve with it to be able to meet the needs, whatever the new need is, if you will, of the organization. And I'll, I'll talk about just time to fill as an example. We have customers that are doing kind of class hiring. So they, they start people on certain days of the week or whatever. And we often are, they're asking about time to fill. And and we have, I don't want, I hate to say wake them up, but have the conversation to say, is time to fill really the right metric? I think honestly, the right metric is our, the fill ratio. If, if you need 10 people to start, do, you know, do you have 10 people starting? It doesn't necessarily matter if it took 30 days or 10 to get those 10 starts there. It, that's really what matters. And so we really try to work with our customers to under, peel back the onion and really understand what, what's driving their organization so that we can put the right measures in place to really move the needle versus checking the box to say, okay, we are better than we were on this one particular metric. That, that reminds me, years ago, I interviewed, here on the podcast, I interviewed the head of town acquisition at HR Block. And one of the things she told me is, she said, our managers kept coming to me and they'd say, hey, we need a person. And she said, we, it felt like we were always just doing this. We can never quite connect because they're asking for something and they don't realize that to get that one person, that end result, I have to back into, I need to, to look at a hundred resumes to find that one person. And so she said, the next time someone came, she said, okay, I've taken the liberty of putting together the hiring funnel for this position based on the last time we filled it. I need you to tell me what you, and then she just stopped and let them look at it. And they said, wait a minute, this is the hire, but then it takes this long to screen them. It takes this long to, and they backed into those the actual, and she said it changed every conversation going forward because she just helped clue them in on that. And she said at the same time, she then got more deep conversations about, okay, here's where we're going as a business. And here's what we're thinking of next. And to your point, they use a lot of cohort based hiring. We're bringing in a group mm -hmm. of time. Like, so she learned about, here's why we do that. By the way, there's a training fallout down the line that we have to do that. Otherwise it gets way too costly to do it one at a time, onesies and twosies. And so I, I love that recommendation there on that piece of it because I think that's a suggestion for everybody out there. I'm a fan of any time we can we can knock uh, time to fill off its pedestal. I'm a fan <laughs> of that. Anyway, because it doesn't tell us very much about the quality of your hiring process or who you're putting through it at the end of the day. Right, right. Tim, early on when you started this conversation, you said you have seen hiring change and not change throughout all this time you've, you've been exposed to, to the space. And I would love if you are prepared to do this, I'd love to hear from you an example or two of this is what it has always taken. It's took it then, it takes it now to be great at hiring. And then an example or two of how today is a radically different environment and it's evolved to everything else. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it starts with designing the process to win. So we've always, we've always had the mindset, you need to, it, much like a, an assembly line at a plant, it's engineered to deliver a result. Mm -hmm. Hiring process needs to be engineered to deliver X and uh, you have to have, and we're, we have a lot of data analytics here. We've always have had, but it's, you have to know where you are and that's going to change week by week, month, month, quarter by quarter, et cetera. So you have to be aware of, so you have to have the process built to deliver. Next, you have to have a resource model that's experienced individuals that's appropriately resourced to help you with the ebb and flows of the hiring. And those sound basic. It's corny, but that's the secret success of success of successful hiring. But you also then have to be realistic for those around you. And so again, measurement and data and baselines come into play to say, what's, what is time to fill? What's candidate satisfaction? What's candidate quality? What's hiring manager satisfaction? What do all these things mean? And you better have good communications. Back in the day, we used to send out status letters to a lot of, we were doing plant startups for uh, paper mills and, and just automotive, et cetera. And you get, you would get 10,000 to over 50,000 people apply. And that's at least three letters to every candidate. So we, that's before postage was what it is today, Ben, but that was what we used to do back in the day. And we would travel state to state and be gone for, you know, weeks at a time, months at a time. 
So my, that's the basics. That's the foundation for success with hiring. And then open dialogue with the hiring managers. Today, fast forward, still have to have those things in play. Technology's changed the world, but so has Amazon, meaning it's a billboard world. I want it to be easy. Almost every prospect we speak with, one of their first questions is, what technology can I invest in? Take this go away. And, and you can't because you have to have a process. Candidates need that personal touch and concierge service, if, if you will. But technology has changed. And I just the temperament of a candidate and a hiring manager no longer is it we're coming together because we're humans and we want to talk. I think it's just we've gone fast forward and no one has as much time to invest in each other. And so your process needs to filter and the role that we play for most of our clients is really helping remove that transactional work that they call it. And we personalize that with our with the candidates and with the hiring managers. And so we're, again, we're properly resourced to allow those things to come together and, and establish warning programs. So I don't know if there was any aha moments for you in that, but it's pretty basic. And Pam, I don't know if you have any comments on that, but what's old is, is new again for the most part. I would say yes. The foundation, as you said, is the, is the process and, and quite honestly, the technology. But what has changed significantly is the expectation of candidates. Hmm. And it doesn't matter what level and we're, what the way we're operating today is significantly different because we are, we have to address the need of the candidate in a way that's different than it ever has been. Whether that means the speed of the process, the complexity of the product, candidates really, their tolerance level, they, the opportunities are abound, right? So therefore, if, if the process that I have is too cumbersome or just it takes too much of my time. I can go elsewhere, typically, to find an opportunity. So people are doing that. So we, and then insert, so insert more technology to help move the process a bit quicker while still providing that, the balance of relationship to ensure that at the end of the day, it is, it's a partnership, right, between the employee and the employer. And we want to make sure we're, we're matching the right talent. And so that takes a lot of personal touch as well. So it's really a balancing act while trying to, while doing it at a high level of speed. I'm so yeah. glad that you both did the process piece as, as the focus here, because I want to remind everyone listening, everybody wants that easy button. Like I am <laughs> still looking for it. I, every morning I spend a few minutes every day, just walking around looking for that easy button, but right, it doesn't exist. It's not as simple as that. And the things that lead to good outcomes usually are, are not exciting. They're not, mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, like I never would have thought about that. We should have a mm -hmm. good team that's properly trained, that's equipped to do the work, that has the right tools at their fingertips, right? Yes, we all know those things. We're looking for the easy thing. And so I'm glad we're really touching on some of those core fundamentals of what great hiring looks like. Tim, I think you had one thing you were going to chime in there potentially. Yeah, I did. And, and that's regarding technology. And, and I think Pam would agree with me. It is, it plays a big role. You must have this, but it starts with the clients and the company's applicant tracking system, ATS, that ensuring it's configured to deliver the reports, obtain the data points you need, but also to make sure that it's built for the candidate and the hiring manager and HR. So there's, so it's a win, win, win there. It's also imperative in today, today's modern candidate has expectations that they can apply mobile. Most folks just don't have that, unfortunately. And then automated scheduling, you, you have to have that. Scheduling has always been a bear back in 1990 and in 2022, it's still a bear, but automation allows you, has cleared that, has made that a little easier, but those are the, the primary areas you need technology. Now there's a lot of other things you can use, but we're talking with folks that still just don't have some of those, ess the essence of real technology can really help optimize. And those are the things that candidates expect. If you don't have it, they're moving on to another opportunity. And I'll actually make it even worse for everybody listening into this, by the way, not only will candidates in general move on, but the highest performers that have the most choice in the market, they're the ones that are going to have the lowest tolerance for a crummy or high friction kind of process. Mm -hmm. So this isn't just you yeah. losing out on, we're willing to put up with some people not con continue this workflow or this 87 click apply process, mm -hmm. but to say the people who are the best performers, the ones that you really want on your team versus over at the competitor, they're the ones you're going to miss out on the most often. They're the high mm -hmm. population. It's going to just say, I'm not putting up with this. I'll go, mm -hmm. I'll find some other place to do this. So yeah. Tim, actually you sparked another thought that it's something we haven't touched on yet. And 
I think it's a really um, key component to success is hiring managers. One thing that we are finding time and again and spending more time as we are engaging with new customers, we're spending more time with hiring managers, educating them on what the market is today, what expectations of candidates are and such. I think often that component is over and it causes challenges, right? If hiring managers are still, quite honestly, they need to be selling the opportunity alongside of screening candidates for these roles. And if if they're just the old school, hardcore, just like I'm going to I'm going to just work Ben here to see what Ben has. Like that doesn't work. And um, helping them understand the the best way to screen candidates while also selling the opportunity, the organization and, and understanding what's important to Ben, that piece is really critical and one that's very often overlooked. It's funny because that when I am naturally shy, okay, in person. So that's a heads up for everybody out there listening in. If we meet in person, Expect that a little bit. When I started recruiting, I was nervous about that part. It was part of my mini job duties as as an HR professional. And so they said, hey, you go recruit something too. Okay, why not? But I was nervous. What I found was I actually got excited about those pieces you're talking about there because I found that many of our hiring managers were like, here's the job. Do you want Mm -hmm. it? And I was, we are an amazing company. You would love to work here because here's here's how we treat people. And I got excited (laughs) about those things. And so it made it easy for me that when I was around hiring managers, oh, you talk about this better than I do. I said, cause I'm not talking about the job. I haven't mentioned mm-hmm. the job yet. I'm talking about what it feels like to be here and what it feels to be someone that, that works here. This is how they feel. We see mm-hmm. it in the data from current employees. And if I can get them to feel a little bit of that, because I can almost guarantee you, they don't feel that at work right now. Not if they're having mm-hmm. a conversation with us. So that, that was the light bulb moment for many of our leaders to start being a little more focused on What's important to you? Okay, let me tell you about how we solve that problem or what's a frustration you've had at work. Oh, we don't do that here. Here's how we approach it. And Mm -hmm. giving them some tools to be able to have a little bit better conversations even if they didn't turn into Pollyanna, Kumbaya, let's all hold it. Mm -hmm. It still gave them uh, some tools to have those conversations with people who are coming in for the jobs. And it wasn't just a take it or leave it. Here's the job. Mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting. Ben, you mind if I share an example of that? But when we start with a new client, we have, uh, as part of our implementation program, we have an acculturation phase. And acculturation allows us to truly understand the DNA of the client, the organization, really go beyond just reading their website, the mission, you know, what they're doing socially, who they, what they stand for. But it's also helping them to enhance and better articulate their, their value proposition to candidates because it, you can't live by one. If it's of engineering, I need... Mean, these three, if it's, you know, manufacturing. So we, we do that. But why I bring this up is in that acculturation phase, we're spending time with hiring managers because we know based on our, our decades of success, it starts there and you have to have positive, you have to build trust and earn, you have to earn your respect and be, earn your right to be called a partner by the hiring manager by delivering the results. But you get there by informing and educating. And we find so many times that Recruiters are just a taskmaster. Here's what I need. And the beat down happens. You're just there an order taker versus what we're trying to do is change management through this is just bringing data to inform them of the reality of who they are, how competitive they are, the baseline and supply demand. And to your point, then it gets fun. And then they start opening up and sharing. And now that allows me to really start sharing the stories, but better impacting the business other than just delivering a quality hire. I'm going beyond that. And we're, that's where, that's the place we love to play. So let's add that to our, our list of things that haven't changed about great recruiting. It's yeah. having good stakeholder relationships with your hiring managers, because if you have that kind of rapport, you're talking about there, that kind of back and forth, you can ask them for some things that may be a little bit onerous, but there's something in the bank there. They're willing to go to bat for you or vice versa. They can say, Hey, I know here's the reality. Can you help me with this thing? And we're willing to go back, go to bat for them because it's not this constant head butting. I told you this, you said that, why don't you have them? We avoid those things because we have a shared goal, shared language. And excellent. I love that. Okay. There's, I have one question I want to ask to take us towards the close. And it's the only problem is it's wide open. So fair warning for the audience out there. This one could go in any direction. I have no clue what they're going to say to this, but one of the things that we we did in the study is we looked at all these different facets. Some of them we talked about already, some we haven't, right? We looked at things like comp. We looked at things like trying to add more recruiters to your team as a way to solve some of the 
really difficult hiring market challenges that are out there right now. And I'd love to hear from you, is anything working or what are you seeing companies trying? Or it doesn't matter to me which direction you take it, but I'd love to hear, Pam, if you want to kick us off and start this, what are companies trying? What's working? Pick some version of that because I'd love to hear from you. You're seeing this on the front lines across multiple companies. So you have that benefit that the other leaders here don't have. They see only their own internal set of op openings and requisitions. They don't get to see that across customers like you do. So what's your thought there? So my thought is <laughs> we see them trying a lot and oftentimes they're looking for a quick fix. So I, we're going to bring in two contract recruiters or, you know, looking at tech. There's, there are a lot of technologies out there that certainly add value. But what I will say is those that are doing it well and really moving the needle are those that are looking at this issue holistic. And what that means in my mind is it, it, it's a combination of a lot of things. What is your employment brand or what are, what is our employment brand in the market? Who are we competing with in our market? How does our comp, you know, how does our total compensation package compete in that market? Do we, do we know how to sell to candidates? Is the, pro all these things we've talked about, it's really, it's pulling all of that together into a program that actually is then executed consistently. Those that are doing, again, looking at it holistically. I said it earlier when, in that this is a really complex issue. And, and so therefore it's, there's not a simple fix. Um, and I would love to say that, or I would say that I, I would love for people, for organizations to really be thinking about what is their real cost of this challenge? Because there's a whole nother web um, podcast that we can do talking about that because it's vacancies are not filled. It, it's just a snowball effect on an organization. If they're not filling their jobs in, in an appropriate amount of time, it could really be a, come a, a downward spiral pretty quickly. But I was going to tell you really quickly, a, a story that will make you smile and cringe at the same time. So years ago, the last company I was recruiting for, we had a position that was open and I kept coming back to the hiring manager and he never would budge on it. He just, mm -hmm. he just never had an, oh, I'm too busy right now. I'll come back to that. I knew one day he was going to say, Hey, I'll need them tomorrow. And so I was trying to pre preempt that. And one day he said, Hey, you know what? I just realized that position has been open for three months. We've saved three months worth of salary. I said, yeah, but we have three months of time on this contract. We could have been billing and we don't have a person in that slot. So we're losing revenue every day. Right. The person's not there. And he sat back in his chair and I could see the, the wheels turning. He said, can we look at the candidates tomorrow? Like, oh, finally, oh, wow. I was saying this three months ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Right. That, and you have to make it, put it in their terms. Uh, Y'all mm -hmm. both covered that in the conversation so far, but you've got to make it plain to them, make it clear to them. And it's not just a, Hey, we should hurry on this because that sounds like what's well, right. your priority. And suddenly mm -hmm. it, it, it matters then. And then if, if and every, we all have challenging jobs that we're working on it. It's, and we talked about the importance of that relationship with the manager, but then really starting to peel that back and say, do you really need, really need this experience and that experience, which one's priority and let's focus on the priority. And, and can you train the other a bit and like help them work through that challenge? as opposed in, in giving them options. And honestly, then as you do that, you can demonstrate how that opens up the, the pool of candidates in the market. And we talk a lot about using the data, but what we find is hiring managers, they, they really are starting to, to really yearn for that type of information because that does help them make better decisions for the organization. Yes. Excellent. All right, Tim, what you got? You know, I, I go back to this, those companies are having success with their hiring program today. have always had they're progressive. They have a thought leader. The C-suite has made it a priority. There's, you know, we, your report, I think said 83% responded that to hiring as a business priority. I, I trust that, but a lot of the, the individuals we speak with, I'd say it's more 50, 50, 50, if you will. But I think the biggest thing, I, my value or what I would say on that is it's just discipline. So not all of us are fit like you, Ben, but it requires discipline and a commitment. And we talked to a lot of folks, they just want, what's the technology? What's the shortcut? And there's not one. You can be, you can look like a star maybe this month, but it's going to catch up with you. So 
it's accepting where you are today. It's fixing that, resolving that, but it's discipline execution, but it's a commitment to just knowing your numbers and being realistic about that, but just constant improvement. And so to me, that's the business priority where talent acquisition needs to be for some companies it truly is, but for most it just is not. And it's getting some windshield time and then it goes away. I've heard the term multiple times in this conversation, but for the audience out there, the thing that keeps coming back to me is this term of consistency. We can't, you may solve this one problem or fill that one slot or whatever, make that one hiring manager happy by doing something. But if that isn't a part of a, a little bit of rigor, a little bit of discipline to use your word there, Tim, that's not a part of this ongoing, this is our commitment to what it looks like. And part of that is you've got to be willing to put in the work. But part of that is we need to make sure we're elevating this, going back to the beginning of the conversation, elevating this to the people who can make sure we have the right investment and support for what it takes to be a very talent focused organization. Because if you don't have that, you can churn your wheels all day and it will not matter. So you've got to have those things all together. And I think the consistency piece here is really important, not just because it, it helps you solve the problems, but you don't want the reputation in, in the marketplace as, oh, that's the place where you apply and don't ever hear back, or that's the place where they'll interview you, but good luck if you don't get the job, you're, you basically don't exist. Like, you don't want the reputation consistency. It would have been so much easier and so much cheaper to not send out thousand letters or, you know, what you're talking about earlier, Tim, it's even easier now because if you have the right tools and things in place and you have the discipline to use them, it can help you to be better at follow-up, better at closing the loop, better at, Hey, this one's no, but the next one may be a yes. And building those really relationship focused, really focused, human focused relationships with those candidates mm -hmm. doesn't happen naturally. It tends to take us. We've got to focus on it to make that come to order. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So if someone is interested in learning more about advanced RPO, the work that you and the team are doing, things like that, what's the best way for them to connect or follow? Yeah, I'd say follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Our website is advancedrpo.com. We do a lot of consulting. It all starts with the conversation. So reach out to us for a no-cost assessment of your hiring program, and we'll have fun. We'll share some data, exchange some good ideas, and I'll help you with your talent acquisition journey. Awesome. Wonderful. I want to thank you both for joining us today, for sharing your passion, you Tim, like it or not, you are pioneers, right? You're blazing a trail and you're giving great <laughs> advice and great suggestions to the employers out there, reminding them that there's no easy button for hiring. So thank you both for spending some time with us today. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Absolutely. To everybody else out there, I hope you've got some great suggestions, some ideas, some good food for thought in the conversation today. I want to encourage every one of you listening in to make a couple notes now on what you're going to do next. And one of those things on your list needs to be talking with your leadership about how this can take a higher priority because I guarantee you someone else out there is talking about that same thing in your space and you don't want to be the last one to the table. Thank you all for joining us on We're Only Human and we will catch you next time. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. I'm honored to have you as a listener. If you enjoyed this episode, please take 10 seconds to rate it at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Also, if you know a friend that could benefit from today's conversation, please pass it their way. After all, a rising tide lifts all ships. To see show notes, sponsor information, and our full show archives, visit OnlyHumanShow.com.